technology means we have to switch so that we can get connected. Beautiful day. We Michiganders enjoy the beautiful weather. Unfortunately, my wife and I have to go back to Michigan tomorrow. So we are sorry about that, but the good news is we're still here. And you're here. And we're here to learn from the Bible again what God wants to say to us. Now I need to tell you that one of the things I learned early on as a teacher, and uh, I spent one year in teaching, and I realized that teaching in a high school was probably not my gift. But one of the things I learned is that I learned a whole lot more than the students did. I had to teach English of all things. Now, that's not my favorite subject, but the principal said I was teaching English, along with other things. So I taught English. I didn't like English when I studied it. I am not sure I liked it when I taught it, but I knew a lot better about English when I taught it than when I was learning in school. So I'm sorry, but you're getting, you're getting what I learned, but I learned the most. But I hope you're being blessed by what you hear as well. This is our third in a session, a series of four sessions, and this is our third time together, especially looking at how the Bible looks at the time that we refer to as the Passion of Christ weekend, Easter weekend, however you refer to it. But the Bible has some amazing things to say about it that we have just taken for granted. Today, you're going to think I'm talking a lot about nothing. But all of a sudden, you're going to find out I'm talking a lot about something important to God. If it's important to God, should it be important to you? Should it be important to me? I think so. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer here as we turn our attention to Father in heaven, I just pray that you will take the words that I speak and use them to your honor and glory. For they have no value if they don't come from you. I pray that you'll give us also ears to hear. Hear what you want to say to us. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the sequence of the Passion Weekend of Christ, there were three main days. There was Friday, there was Saturday, there was Sunday. Those three days are celebrated by the Christian world, but not always, by realizing, is that better? See, I've got to listen to my wife, she's trying to tell me if you can. Can you hear me okay now? Is that better? All right. On those three days, the world often thinks about these events but doesn't concentrate on what the Bible says about those events. Just what they may have been told about those events. But you and I need to be going to the Bible, for the Bible is our source of truth, yes? As we said when we started on Thursday night, the Bible is our textbook. It's the book that we go to to be able to learn what it is God wants us to know. And... I've been amazed just in preparing for this presentation of all that was in there. Only as I've dug into it have I discovered this. And that's only the Lord. And I, I want you to know, it's not because I'm smart. It's because it's there all the time. I have to dig. You and I have to dig a little bit. And there it is. I want to remind you a little bit of what it is that we're going to be talking about today. We want to talk about a special angel's message of hope in Revelation. You know what? The world needs hope today. I don't know about you, but my life is packed full. And uh, I'm not that far away from retiring, but now I'm not sure that's a good idea. Because people I talked to who are retired said, you don't want to retire. You don't have any time when you retire. <laughs> I don't get that part. That somewhere in there, retirement was supposed to be calmer and more peaceful and quiet and no schedules. There it is the problem. Everybody thinks your schedule is theirs now. And so you're busier than ever. That's what I'm beginning to understand. So I don't know about this retirement thing. But while you and I are living our daily lives, 
whether it's in retirement or not, in work, we are stressed. I, I say, I, people say, how are you doing today? Well, I'm busy, just like everybody else. Everybody's busy. Every minute seems to be occupied with something. Is there any hope for this? The way we live today? I believe there is. God has a plan for us. You know, I think it's time for me to put it over the way it's supposed to be. There we go. That's what I wanted. So I want to back up for a moment and just pick up a couple of key pieces. The focus of the Bible is on Jesus Christ, on His story, on the Gospel. We've been concentrating on that in the last couple of days. The central focus of the Gospel is the cross upon which Jesus died. Isn't that what the Easter weekend's all about? That's what Good Friday is about. That's what we talked about last night. We talked about what it was that Jesus has done for us on the cross. But I want to remind you of something. In our journey in the Bible, we've also discovered that the Bible is consistent from beginning to end. Now, that shouldn't take any discovery, but for some people, that is a new concept. The Bible is consistent. It talks about something one place. When it talks about it again, it talks about it later. It is consistent what it says about it. It doesn't come up with something and then change it midstream. It is consistent, and when the Bible speaks about something, you and I want to look at it and see, not just in terms of information, but the Bible is an action book, an action book because God is leading us to a life He wants us to live, not just a life He wants us to know about. The Bible is constantly connecting these important pieces and events and these principles together. It's easy to miss important details by assuming that we already know what's there. That's, that's dangerous in a lot of ways. Amen. Now, we have to come to the Bible with our understanding. But we have to be prepared to allow the Bible to change our understanding if that's what the Bible says. I've read the Bible through many times, too many to remember how many. I haven't kept track. The one thing I found that is every time I go through the Bible, there's something that I didn't see before. Well, yes, I saw it, but it didn't click in my mind at that particular time. If you're a student of the Bible, perhaps you've had the same experience. I saw some of your heads nodding, and you knew what I was talking about. But we need to remember that sometimes the details are minor. Once in a while, though, they are life-changing and we miss them. It's important that we identify all of these connected pieces because they are there for a reason. So let's quickly review what we did last night. And that is, we saw in our study in Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 that I saw there another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation tribe, tongue, and people. God's last day message is pictured as being carried by angels in mid-heaven. Why? Because it's an urgent message. We talked about the fact that angels are messengers. You and I are messengers for God in carrying the message to the world. But there's a special message that God wants to bring to us, and it especially focuses in on the gospel. Mind you that we said that the word gospel comes from that old English word God. What does not mean God in heaven simply means good. God is good, and there's a connection there. But also the old English word spell, which means news or story. In other words, the gospel is the good news and refers to the story of Jesus Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. To summarize it quickly. The gospel is the good news of what Jesus did for me. It's the good news of what Jesus did for you. It's the good news that He came into this world to live a righteous life and then to die as a sacrifice for our sins. Why is that good news? Because it means for us forgiveness for our sins and the opportunity to accept eternal life that He gives to us freely. The gospel is good news because of Good Friday, we said. 
because of what Jesus did on the cross on Good Friday when he died and gave his life for us, we are able to have the assurance of eternal life. That is, we said, really good news for you and for me. Amen. Why? Because we are sinners. And by right condemned to death, we are guilty of breaking God's law and not being obedient to Him. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden, and it's been our problem ever since. But there is hope because of what Jesus did on Good Friday. Good Friday was the culmination of God's gospel plan, His rescue plan to save the world of, uh, of people who are dying in sin. We also said that information about Jesus, uh, what He did for us, is not enough to save us. Information will not save us. Our decision must be a personal one. We must respond to Him personally. We must accept His sacrifice for us in order to be ready when He comes. And that's where we ended the last night. But the story goes on. Easter weekend was not done on Friday. Hallelujah! It was not done on Friday. Isn't that good news? Yes. Now, Friday was good news. But the news gets better. Yes. This morning I have a question for you. We are studying this weekend about the Easter story, the Passion of Christ story, what Jesus did for us. But we've only made it through Friday. But now we want to move on to another day. After the cross, the question is, and this is the question I want to ask you, what happened next? Think about it. What happened next? What event, according to the Bible, followed the crucifixion? Well, in order to help us, we need to go to the Bible. And so I want you to go to your Bibles. I told you it's our textbooks. If you need a Bible, there's one in front of you in the pew there. I also have some of the text on the screen, but not all of it. We're going to start in Luke chapter 23. And I'd like you to turn there with me, Luke chapter 23. And we're going to see this passage where Luke, who was a doctor, by the way, a scientist, scientific mind, he cared about details, he cared about dates, he cared about lots of things. And in Luke chapter 23, he has these interesting details about the death of Jesus and what happened. In Luke 23, we're going to begin with verse 44. I'm reading from the Bible. It's not on your screen, just follow along with me. We're going to go um, through just a few of these verses in, at first. Verse 4, 44, now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now when you and I look at this, I want to just summarize a few of the other little details there. Those details are that the centurion then responded to what he had seen and heard, and he gave glory to God and simply said, certainly this was a righteous man. Wow, that Roman centurion was not a Christian. He was a Roman. He was a pagan Roman. But he spoke more truth there than he realized. Jesus was indeed a righteous man. And then the women that were there observed the scene, and Luke says that before Friday was over, Jesus was taken and buried in the garden tomb. In verse uh, 54, we find... Is it 54? No, that's not where I want to be yet. Then... Um, Make sure I'm getting in the right place. Yeah, in verse 50, Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man, and he took the body down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb. Now, considering the circumstances and what was happening, Jesus had no money. What little money the disciples had, Judas had spent on betraying Jesus. Or had gotten, I shouldn't say not spent, but he had 
gone, and they even lost his life over the whole situation. And so there was really no money. They might have had a little bit of money, but they didn't have a place to bury Jesus. But there was a very rich man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. He was a good and just man, and he had not consented, in verse 51, to their decision in their deed to crucify Christ. And so he decided he wanted to do something. In verse 52, the Bible says, This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, and he wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever been laid before. And the day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. Now here is something you probably didn't even notice before, and I want you to think about the details of what Luke just shared. One of those connected pieces that I spoke about is right here that you could easily just float on by and not even realize it was there, let alone be interested about whether it's something that should be spent time looking at. But a careful study of these passages, in it, in the next few minutes, we will see that the Bible is indeed connected from beginning to end. The Bible is willing to reveal things to us if we are willing to think those thoughts. I want to remind you, first of all, though, again, that the cross is central to the gospel. The gospel story centers in the Bible on the cross of Christ. Every detail should be carefully reviewed. And if there is a piece that we've ignored, we should check it out to determine how important that detail is. We will know if it is important if it's connected elsewhere in the Bible. It is important that a whole day of Easter weekend is devoted to it, and yet most of the world ignores it. Most of the Christian world doesn't even seem to realize it's there. But I know you won't ever forget it again after today. I want to see if you notice the point. If we look again at the Bible passage and what it says that we just read, we will discover something interesting. And I want to read it again. I'm belaboring a point. There's no question about it. But look at verse 50. I want to read it again. Follow with me. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. Then this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. Did you see it? Did you notice it? Did you catch the significance of that? Well, I want to zero in with a magnifying glass, if you don't mind. So we're going to look at that verse again. In chapter 23, verses 50 through 54, it's on your screen. It says, Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good, just man. He had not consented to the decision, their decision and the deed. You're saying you're really belaboring this point. Yes, because... You and I sometimes have to look through the Bible and look carefully so that we don't miss the details that are important to God. He was from Arimathea, city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. And he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and he wrapped it in linen. He laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever been laid before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. It's time to bring out the magnifying glass. The last part of that passage says, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. 
I want to summarize what took place that day, because I want you to catch this. The significance is missed by many people. If you look at these verses piece by piece, you will remember that our special focus of this weekend is to understand the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus like we never have understood it before. So first of all, Joseph takes the body of Jesus off the cross and he lays it in his own tomb. And then Luke says these words. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Continuing on a little farther, it says the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they absorbed the tomb, observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. They rested on the Sabbath, the Bible says, according to the commandment. So for a second time, the Sabbath is mentioned in this short passage and it speaks of it as the Sabbath according to the commandment. In verse uh, a little further down, he says, Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. What does Luke mean when he says, according to the commandment? Here we are talking about Easter weekend. And right at the heart of this weekend and the events of this weekend is a truth so profound, and yet most people miss it. Why do they miss it? Because it's hidden? No. Because it's so well understood in the Bible, but so misunderstood by most of Christianity that we ignore it. The people who, Luke, who wrote this, he knew what he was writing. He didn't need to explain it in detail because everybody in his time who read it understood what he was saying. But for you and for me, it goes by us because we assume something about it that's really not truly biblical. What is, does he mean when he says the commandments? The clues are here, and let's just follow the clues for a moment. The clues are the word Sabbath, then he says according to the second clue, commandment. Luke says this as though we should know what he's talking about. The reason it is, is because all those who were listening to him knew what he was talking about. The people who were alive then certainly knew what he was talking about. When he said this, they knew he was talking about something that came from the Ten Commandments given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai to give to his people. Let's pause and briefly review the commandments so we can get this straight. Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 20. Keep your place in Luke because we'll come back here. And go back to Exodus very briefly. Exodus chapter 20, I want you to make sure that you know I'm not making this up. It's right out of the Bible. It's right there. You always have to check me. You never know what I'm telling you. I could be confusing you even more, but the Bible will not confuse you. It may help you get unconfused. In Exodus chapter 20, and looking at verse, uh, starting with verse 3, we find the commandments. And it starts with the first one in verse 3. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. God says, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. He says, if you put something before me, you are going to squeeze me out of your life. That's a good idea, isn't it? We don't want to squeeze God out of our life. We want God at the center of our life. But I want you to notice, the Sabbath is not there. So, that wasn't what he was talking about. In the next second commandment, verses 4 through 6, it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Essentially, I'll summarize it by what's on the screen, you shall not make any graven images and bow down to worship them. God was telling us that when people do that, it demoralizes them. It denigrates them. They have a wrong conception of what God is like. So God says, it's just better that you don't do that. Worship me, but you don't need something to be able to worship in order to worship me. I'm much bigger than anything that you can make, and I'm much more powerful than anything you can make, and I love you a whole lot more than anything you can make. 
But the Sabbath is not here either. So, we must not have been talking about that commandment. Well, let's keep going. The next commandment is in verse 7. It says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God simply says, If you want to honor me, don't swear by me. Don't swear at people using my name. Maybe don't swear at all. My name is holy. I died on the cross for you. You don't want to take my name in vain. But so far, there's nothing about the Sabbath. Then we get to verses 8 through 12. And that verse starts out by saying, remember the Sabbath. Oh, the Sabbath is right here, isn't it? Remember the Sabbath day, it says. Six, uh, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work for the Sabbath of the Lord. Uh, seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, notice this part, file it in your memory because we're going to come back to this in a moment. For in six days the Lord did what? Made, Made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You know what? We can't find time for each other today. But God had a solution to that problem. He gave us time. You know what? You don't have enough money to buy time. Amen. But God gave you time ahead of time. And just in case you decided you didn't need that time, He made a commandment to say, no, you need this time. That's where our hope comes from. He has given us hope. And He has given us time. Because He's given us time for family. He's given us time especially for Him. But when we get together with family, when we get together with God, we have time to spend with family because God created family too. And He wants us to have that fellowship and that connection. Christians can't find time for God. Remember what it was like in the old days? Perhaps you may be when people went to church and then you go to grandma's house and then people were taking the day with God and with each other. Society was seen more peaceful back in those days. So I've been told. But now we found the Sabbath commandment which we were looking for because in Luke he referred to it like everybody knew about it. But so many people knew nothing about it. Right here at the time of that Easter weekend, there Jesus is referring to the Sabbath day. And he at that moment was resting in the grave. The Sabbath commandment tells us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We don't need to re read the rest of the commandments because this is the one we're looking for. It would be good too, but I'm not going to take the time to read those today. The issue the disciples were concerned with at that particular time was that Jesus' death was fresh before them. And they still wanted to be obedient to the Sabbath commandment. But they needed and wanted to take care of the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea took the body down. But they did not want to do any more work beyond that. His body was carried to the grave and it was put in the tomb. But the work that they wanted to do in preparing his body, they decided that it would wait to another day until the Sabbath was over when they could finish working on the embalming of Jesus' body. It is clear from what is said next in the passage. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to anoint his body, came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the preparation day is the day that Christ died. The next day, according to the Bible, was the Sabbath. It was the day that Christ rested according to the commandment. And the last day and the first day of the week when the woman anointed his body. So it's very clear to us about the sequence of events. I want to review them so it is clear. First of all, Friday. The Bible calls it the preparation day. 
it's not hard, hard, hard for us to understand that the preparation day was what we call Friday because every Easter weekend begins with what is called Good Friday. And we all know that the day that Jesus died on the cross and the day he was laid in the tomb was Friday. So what society today honors in regard to Christ and his death is consistent with the Bible. The Bible then tells us that the next day in the sequence was Sabbath. We call it Saturday.